scripture reading is taken from two parts of the Bible. We turn first of all to the book of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. We'll read the entire chapter, following which we'll turn to our main passage in Ephesians 6 concerning the whole armour of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 1, this is God's inspired word. But of the times and the seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you. For yes, yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction shall uh, come upon them as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. But ye brethren are not in darkness, that that day should overtake you as a thief. Ye are all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us, who are of the day, be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with Him. Wherefore, comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also ye do. And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labour among you, and are over you in the Lord, and admonish you and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake, and be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn them that are unruly, comfort the feeble-minded, support the weak, be patient toward all men. See that none render evil for evil unto any man, but ever follow that which is good, among, both among yourselves and to all men. Rejoice evermore, Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Quench not the Spirit. Despise not prophesyings. Prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. Abstain from all appearance of evil. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. And I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he that calleth you, who also will do it. Brethren, pray for us. Greet all the brethren with a holy kiss. I charge you by the Lord that this epistle be read unto all the holy brethren. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Let's turn now to Ephesians 6. Ephesians chapter 6, and we'll read the portion that sets forth the whole armour of God, namely verse 10 onwards through to verse 20. Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 20, concerning the whole armour of God. Verse 10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armour of God, that ye may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armour of God, that ye may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, 
which is the Word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Thus far, we read from God's inspired word. The text is the first half of verse 17, and that reads, And take the helmet of salvation. May the Lord bless the reading of His word. Armour. The whole armour of God. Put it on. Beloved congregation and fellow soldiers in our Lord Jesus Christ, that is the standing order of the commander and captain of our salvation, Jesus Christ. Do you hear it? And hearing it, do you heed it? Woe to the one who fails to heed the command of Jesus. For the Christian is one who stands in the midst of a fierce, deadly spiritual warfare. A warfare that has begun with the fall of our first parents and will continue to rage on all the way till King Jesus comes again. And a warfare not merely against human beings, flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world who are formidable, powerful enemies, who are relentless in their attacks of us and who are able to destroy us. Indeed, in this warfare, there has been great and many casualties of war, haven't there? Scripture sets forth great examples of men who have failed to heed this command of Jesus. And they have failed to do so to their great harm and injury. I speak of leaders such as Judge Samson, King David, a man after God's own heart, and also the Apostle Peter in the New Testament. And certainly in our small denomination of churches, we are no strangers to the falls, the melancholy falls of office bearers, even leaders of the churches, are we? Certainly, beloved, we have no desire to suffer the same hurt and injury as these men, do we? And we won't. We won't in the way of heeding the command of Jesus to put on the whole armor of God. Every piece of it, all six pieces, in the way of putting on and having on that armor of God, we will be victorious. We will overcome the enemy and all the attacks of the enemy directed at us will be repelled because of this wonderful armour we have on. For bear in mind, this is the whole armour of God. Man didn't design this armour. Man didn't give this armour. This armour was not manufactured in a factory in Detroit. This is God's armour. God's perfectly designed and well-made armor. God designed it with a perfect design so that in the way of taking and putting on every piece of it, we, the soldiers of Jesus Christ, will stand victorious over against all our enemies. And so we put on every piece of this armor of God. Ephesians 6 sets forth six pieces of this armour. It all begins with truth, the girdle or belt of truth. That is the foundational piece of armour 
for the Roman soldier. This is a picture of the Roman soldier here. A foundational piece of armor. Truth, beloved, is foundational for our spiritual well-being. Our attitude towards this book is not that it's just a book of truth. It is the book of truth. And speaking of the girdle of truth, the apostle has in mind also the deep conviction that this is God's truth. That God is truth, that Jesus Christ speaks truth, that the Holy Spirit ministers truth, and that this is truth, truth absolute, and truth applicable to every sphere of life. Truth for life, all of life. It begins with putting on that girdle, this belt of truth. And then we have the second piece of this armor of God, the breastplate of righteousness. The breastplate, of course, protects the upper torso of the body, and in particular, the heart, the human heart, which is critical, of course, for the Roman soldier. We as Christian soldiers need protection of our heart and our inner organs. Therefore, we need this righteousness of God as our breastplate. Note, not our righteousness, but the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. We need that righteousness imputed to us, outside of us in Jesus Christ, imputed to us so that the guilt and shame of our sins, which our enemies use to attack us and direct at our hearts, those attacks are thwarted and repelled. The perfect righteousness of God in Jesus Christ washes away all our sins. All of it. And as well, also, we need a righteousness, the righteousness of God to be imparted to us. I speak of the righteousness that's worked inside of us by the Holy Spirit. We need that because our hearts and lives need to be properly consecrated and devoted to him. Christian soldiers are soldiers who live their lives devoted to Him. They fight for Him. And as well, too, we need the third piece of armor because we need to move around in battle, don't we? And that's where the sandals or shoes of peace, gospel peace, come in like the Roman soldier who has to go from one place to another to fight the battle that he's in, so also Christian soldiers often find themselves in need of moving from one place to another, fighting over here, fighting at the workplace, fighting at home, fighting at church, fighting at different locations. And what's needed to cause the Christian soldier to be able to move quickly and swiftly? Peace. Peace in his heart, peace with God, vertical peace, and as well also a horizontal peace with his neighbor. That's needed for him to move freely from place to place to be an effective, efficient soldier fighting for the Lord Jesus Christ on multiple fronts. And then comes the fourth piece of armor, the shield of faith. That is the shield which is faith. Faith, which has this book as the word of, uh, as its object, is our shield. Living then every hour, every minute, and every second in the word, in faith, and in the word of God, and not apart from it, we engage in the activity of taking up this shield taking up God's Word at various points to shield ourselves from the darts, the arrows, more like it. That's the idea in the text of darts. Long, flamey, flaming, fiery arrows shot at the Roman soldier so that the Christian soldier has, to, has this shield to protect himself from the fiery arrows of temptation. Sexual temptation anger, bitterness, 
the temptation to be jealous and envious of someone else, all kinds of arrows that Satan shoots at us. This shield, the shield of faith, holding it up and using it, protects us from the fiery arrows of the devil. So now consider with me tonight this fifth piece of the armour of God from our King and Captain, Jesus Christ, and His command to us to take it and to put it on in the midst of battle. Notice with me, take the helmet of salvation. Well, notice in the first place tonight, the helmet of salvation itself. In the second place, we'll notice its great importance. And thirdly, we conclude with the command to take it. What is the Christian soldier's helmet of salvation? As always, with every piece of this armour of God, we need to go to where the eyes of the apostle take us. And the eyes of the apostle, of course, are directed at the Roman centurion guarding him and the armour that he has on. Moved by the Holy Spirit, that sight that he has of the Roman soldier, he applies to the Christian soldier. So what is this helmet of salvation? Well, the apostle has his eye on the earthly helmet of the Roman soldier. So what was the Roman soldier's helmet like? The Roman soldier's helmet was made of thick, heavy leather on the inside, and then outside it, a, a thick, heavy metal such as iron or bronze lined it all around, all around except, of course, for a cavity, a window, if you like, a window or cavity around the eyes. That gave the soldier, very importantly, proper sight and field of vision of the battlefield. And on the very top of the Roman soldier's helmet was a plume, a tall plume of feathers, which served clearly to identify that that one over there is a Roman soldier, a soldier of the most powerful army in the world. That description of the Roman soldier's helmet gives good indication of the several functions of the Roman soldier's helmet. Its main function, of course, was to give protection and protection to the Roman soldier's head and neck. A protection over against, especially the, against the broad sword that was used in battle at that time, a broad sword three to four feet long used in battle and commonly directed at the head of the opponent arguably the most important part of the Roman soldier. For beloved, no soldier can go around the battlefield without a head, can he? A headless soldier is a dead soldier. But of course, there were also other functions for the Roman soldier's helmet. For one thing, the window or the cavity around his eyes gave the soldier proper focus and vision for the battle immediately before him. And for another, the plume of feathers on top of the helmet, which clearly signified the Roman army and therefore the most powerful army in the world, gave the Roman soldier confidence as he beheld it on the top of his colleagues who were fighting together with him. Well, that's the Roman soldier's helmet. So we ask the question now, how does that, you see, translate over to the helmet of the Christian soldier, your helmet and mine? The helmet of salvation or the helmet which is salvation, what is all of that about? Mention salvation, and right away we know that it's a broad subject, a very, very broad subject, don't we? So what is the salvation of God? The salvation of God is to be saved from 
the greatest evil, which is sin and its punishment, as you heard this morning, hell, the punishment of hell, and saved unto the greatest good, which is that of life with God. Everlasting life, sweet communion and fellowship with our God, covenant friendship and fellowship with God. So we ask further then, which aspect of salvation does the Holy Spirit have His eye on in this broad range of salvation? A broad a range spanning from eternity past to eternity future. Is it everything? Is it only the past, the present, the future? Does the Holy Spirit have His eye on our election in Jesus Christ from before the foundation of the world? Or is it our redemption accomplished for us by Jesus on the cross 2,000 years ago? Or is He referring to our justification, our sanctification, our glorification still to come? Which is it? The Word of God in 1 Thessalonians 5 narrows it down very nicely for us, in particular, verse 8. Let me read that verse once again. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love, and now notice, and for an helmet, the hope of salvation. The hope of salvation. This laser precise focus of the Holy Spirit in 1 Thessalonians is directed precisely at the hope of our salvation, and that is the same kind of precision and identification rendered to the other pieces of armor. Just as the girdle correlates with truth, the breastplate with righteousness, the shoes or sandals with peace, the shield with faith, so also now the helmet relates exactly with hope, the hope of our salvation. And that, in particular, is our helmet, the helmet of the Christian soldier. Hope, Christian hope, your hope and mine. So we ask, what is Christian hope? I think it's a familiar subject for us, but let me define it for us this way. Hope is the ardent longing yearning for our salvation perfected in heaven, a longing which is absolutely certain and therefore confident, and as well a longing of the heart fueled by the thoughts of the mind. Three things then to expand on tonight. First of all, the object of our hope which is our salvation perfected and to the full, both in soul and body in heaven. Second, certainty, the absolute certainty and therefore confidence of hope that we have. And then thirdly, the fact that it is an ardent longing of heart, fueled by the thoughts of the mind. So we need to keep our focus on the thoughts of the mind. So object, Certainty and mind. First of all, object. The object of our Christian hope, which is salvation to the full in heaven above. Now, all of us have and enjoy salvation to a certain degree. Now we have and enjoy freedom from the rule and tyranny of sin. We are no longer ruled by sin. But we do not yet have a complete freedom from sin. We still sin. And sin cleaves to every single work we perform. And that very thought grieves us, doesn't it? Now we have and enjoy life with God. God is our friend, right, children? You walk with God, you talk with God, God is your friend. You enjoy friendship with Him as your parents do as well. 
we have and enjoy life with God, but we don't yet have and enjoy the fullness of that life, the fullness of that sweet communion of perfect love and holiness. We don't yet have that communion completely unhindered in any way. Now there is yet pain and sorrow and sickness and death in this life. But then, there will be no more pain. There will be no more sorrow, no more tears, no more sickness, no more death. These former things will have all passed away. We'll only have the fullness of life and therefore the fullness of love and joy in the Lord with a glorified soul and glorified body like unto the glorious body of Jesus Christ and surrounded by numerous saints from all the ages numbered as the sand on the seashore. Beloved, do you have that object as your focal point and focus through life? He who has that object as his focal point, who is far-sighted, who sees the end from the nearer objects, who sees way into the distance, has put on the helmet of salvation. And note in the second place, there's absolute certainty and therefore confidence of arriving at the end of our salvation. That's the second element that we are about, about Christian hope. It is absolutely certain. Christian hope is not the hope of human beings here in this world as we would speak to our children. It's still summer vacation, children. Perhaps your parents want to take you to the beach tomorrow. At most they can say to you, well, I hope it doesn't rain tomorrow. And of course, when your parents say that to you, there's of course no guarantee that it won't rain tomorrow. There's not absolute certainty that you will be at the beach. You can't be 100% confident of that. Well, that's not the hope of this text. The hope that we speak of is Christian Hope made of a different material. It is absolutely certain. This is heavenly hope. And being absolutely certain, it is absolutely confident in Jesus Christ. Because Jesus has laid the ground and foundation for, for this hope that we have by His death and resurrection from the cross. He is risen as the head of His body. The rest of His body is going to follow after Him. Jesus, King Jesus, the exalted King Jesus, will see to it because He is now at God's right hand. And He wields the invincible, almighty power of God to realize the hope that we have in our heart to bring to reality that glorious, wonderful object that no amount of money can buy, that no man can ever conceive or even or produce. Putting on the helmet of salvation, we are absolutely certain we'll get there. That's our end and we are certain and confident of it. And because also we understand with our mind that the object of our hope is unspeakably glorious, therefore, number three, ours is an ardent longing of the heart, a longing filled by the thoughts of the mind. And so, beloved, it's important to keep our mind in the things of God and in the Word of God and not let our, have our minds preoccupied with the things of this world. It's important that we be directed in the thoughts of our mind to the hope of our salvation. And what a glorious hope we have. 
who of us, of course, can fully wrap our minds around the glorious hope that we have in our Lord Jesus Christ, something which we sinful creatures of the dust do not at all deserve. We deserve hell in and of ourselves, don't we? But because of what Jesus has done for us, you and I have been begotten unto a living hope, to an inheritance that is incorruptible, undefiled, that fadeth not away, that's reserved in heaven for you and for me, who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. 1 Peter 1, 4 and 5. Such, beloved, is our helmet, the hope of our salvation. Such an extraordinary helmet gives us Christian soldiers focus, confidence in the battlefield, most of all, protection, all-round protection to fight the good fight of faith in the midst of fierce battle for King Jesus. And that protection is, of course, of great importance. For we are protected by this helmet from all kinds of attacks from the enemy. Four ways he attacks us tonight. The great importance of protection. Number one, we need protection from the attraction to the things and pleasures of this world. Now, to be sure, many things in this world are not sinful in and of itself, but the trouble is that you and I have such a nature that is foolishly, so easily and foolishly attracted to them. We make these things our idols. We elevate them to be above God. Isn't this why, beloved, the inspired apostle John gives this stern warning that he does in 1 John chapter 2 to love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is of the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And in this connection, we do well to heed the warning of our Lord Jesus Christ from Matthew chapter 6, verses 19 and 20, to not lay up for ourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. How can, beloved, a Christian soldier fight, let alone stand, when the broad sort of attraction, worldly attraction, strikes a blow upon our heads? Secondly, the helmet of salvation also gives us protection from the fear and dread of tribulation, that is, persecution. And I think especially here of the great tribulation of the end times when Antichrist will have his day on earth. How absolutely fierce that persecution will be. And Scripture gives us very good idea of this thought. I have in mind three passages of Scripture to bring to your attention tonight. First of all, first, the book of 1 Thessalonians. Is this not one reason why it is appropriate that 1 Thessalonians, which is concerned with the church's sober watching and waiting for the return of Jesus, that it mentions in its final chapter the believer's helmet, which is the hope of his salvation. For you see, only the grace of hope can help believers, can help see believers live through those terrible times of persecution that are coming. Something which is explicitly confirmed by Jesus in the Gospels in various ways. And in particular, in the second place, by a rather clear and graphic 
description in Matthew chapter 24. And in connection with the Great Tribulation, I call your attention to these verses, 15 through 22 in Matthew 24, where Jesus says, When ye therefore shall see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, stand in the holy place, whoso readeth, let him understand, then let him which be in Judea flee into the mountains. <clears throat> let him he which is on the housetop not come down to take anything out of his house. Verse 17. Verse 18. Neither let him which is in the field return back to take his clothes. And woe unto him, verse 19, that are with child and to them that give suck in those days. But pray ye that your flight be not in the winter neither on the Sabbath day. And then this, in verses 21 and 22, For then shall be great tribulation. How great? Such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time. No, nor ever shall be. And except, verse 22, those days should be shortened, there should be no flesh saved. But for the elect's sake, those days shall be shortened. And beloved, those days are coming. Then third and finally, I call your attention to the Apostle John in the book of Revelation, confirming the fierce and frightening nature of this great tribulation when he speaks in chapter 11 of the fact that the two witnesses those who are representatives of the church of Jesus Christ on earth, the two witnesses are slain in chapter 11. Isn't that fearful, beloved? How can the Christian soldier fight, let alone stand, when the broad sword of the terror of tribulation, which will silence the church on earth, strikes? Nor is that all. We also need protection from, thirdly, the discouragements we have from sufferings and affliction. And there are, of course, sufferings and afflictions that come from sicknesses of all sorts, physical, emotional, mental, sicknesses, diseases, age, and they come, of course, in all forms, all shapes, all sizes, don't they? And in particular, there are those sufferings connected with tribulation and persecution. And of these, the inspired writer of Hebrews had written his epistle exactly to address this need that some Jewish Christians in his day had. To encourage and admonish these Jewish believers who were so discouraged by their great sufferings from persecution that they were sorely tempted to give up on Jesus. That's Hebrews chapter 10. How can a Christian soldier fight, let alone stand, when the broad sort of discouragement from sufferings strikes him? Fourth and most of all, we need protection from the fear of death. And beloved, how frightening and fearful death all by itself can be. It's been pictured by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 as a huge deadly scorpion, right? He refers to the sting of death. A great, big, dangerous scorpion. That's what death is, pictured to be by the Holy Spirit through Paul. Yes, that's true. But thanks be to God in Jesus Christ that that scorpion has been converted for the believer to a door. And not just a harmless door, but a most significant door, a door that leads into Father's house of many mansions. 
A door which opens up, therefore, to what we hope for, the perfection of our salvation in heaven. So now, putting it all together, what a wonderful helmet that we have, don't we, beloved? That protects us against all these deadly strikes and blows against us, especially directed at our minds. The attraction of the things of this world, the fear of persecution, the discouragements from sufferings and afflictions, and as well the fear of death, the helmet of our salvation protects us from all these assaults directed at our heads and our minds. Fellow soldiers, with me, are you wearing your helmet? You need to. I need to. Not only because of the great dangers and attacks against us in the battlefield going on day after day, but also because we have been commanded to take this helmet up. Take up, says the Holy Spirit, the helmet of salvation. Take it up, Christian soldier. And understand that the command to take it comes from no one else except Jesus Christ Himself, our Saviour and Lord, who is not only our Saviour and Lord, but also our Commander and the Captain of our salvation. And not only should we listen and obey because He is God's appointed authority over us, He is, nor is it only because He owns us, He does, He bought us, He redeemed us with His precious blood, but especially because He has accomplished great victory for us using this helmet of salvation. Beloved, this helmet of salvation works. It absolutely works. And it was none other than Jesus who subjected this helmet to the harshest of tests. He put it on. And putting it on, he had the protection he needed, he had the focus he needed, he had the confidence he needed to go the narrow path and way through the cross into heaven. A text that demonstrates that truth is Hebrews 12, verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. In other words, Jesus was joyful along that pathway of suffering. What accounts for that joy? Was Jesus a sadist? Certainly not. He had joy because... He had on the helmet of salvation that gave him the proper focus on the prize awaiting him at the finishing line. Hebrews 12 is, of course, about running the race of the Christian life. Jesus had a most difficult race, didn't he? He had his eyes set on the prize awaiting him at the finishing line, and that is to be at the right hand of the throne of God. And having his eyes fixed on that prize, the hope that he has, the end that he has, he had strength and motivation to go on running the race. He ran it with joy in his heart. He endured the cross, Hebrews 12, and he also did that despising the shame. In other words, he banished shame to a dark, little corner on the side. Go away, shame. All of that because Jesus had on this helmet of salvation that protected him from attraction to the world, the discouragement of all his intense sufferings that he went through for us. He gazed at that prize through that helmet, the window of his helmet, and that propelled him onward and forward in his race. 
It is this Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, and of which is hope, who calls and commands you and I, Christian soldiers, to take this helmet of salvation, along with all the other weapons we've been equipped with, but tonight especially, to take and put on this helmet of salvation. Take it, use it, and you and I, like Jesus, will, by His grace, have our mind and our eyes properly focused on the prize awaiting us at the finishing line in heaven, even the gracious crown of victory earned for us by Jesus. We will also endure the afflictions that come our way. Our afflictions will feel light. Afflictions that are placed upon us by Father's loving hand. And we will also, like Jesus, despise and any and all the shame of our sins, for they have all been born by Jesus. And in that way, you and I will overcome our mighty enemies and be victorious. Oh, beloved, do you not believe that? Shall we not respond then with heartfelt and thankful obedience unto the captain of our salvation? May it be so for each one of us, now and always. Take on, put on that helmet of salvation and the whole armour of God and fight for your captain and king with the strength of his might. Amen. Lord, bless this word. Use it to stir us up in our spiritual walk of life, also in the week ahead. Week ahead, make us mindful of the many assaults of the enemy that would be directed at us. Make us, therefore, to be sober, watchful, and alert, and be good Christian soldiers. Cause us also to be good parents, teaching our children accordingly, and give to us grace and growth as thou only can and will. Hear us in thy love and mercy, for Jesus' sake. 